Hey, this is Dr. T. Let's review the answers for the tooth numbering exercise. Question one, um, 10 year old male. Now we look at this, the stage of development of these teeth. This needs to make kind of, you know, we, we, we could have guessed the age even without the age based on the development of these teeth. You know, you think about, we, we need to have some idea of eruption pattern. So here we see an incompletely formed um, certainly looks like a second premolar. We're looking at some molars. We have to decide which teeth these are, though, and which quadrant they belong in with uh, an apex that's incompletely formed. So teeth erupt after about half the root is formed, and it's really this root development that drives tooth eruption. Once a root is completely formed, a tooth no longer has eruptive forces. You know, a, a, a third molar that's completely developed and in the bone doesn't move um, once the root is formed all the way. So it's a little bit of a misnomer that that third molars continue to move. They, they don't it, after the root's formed. Um, the other things that help us with the age is the first molar comes in, erupts around age six. You know, there's a range there. It might be six, seven, even eight, but around age six. And the second molar around age 12 and here we see a second molar it look it's erupting but not in occlusion so it makes some sense other things we see on this tooth is we see a huge carious lesion um, if you you know that that is just uh, huge <laughs> um, I personally don't like to use the term carries into the pulp although because it's a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object but this is a huge carious lesion it certainly looks on this radiograph like it's probably there's there's pulpal communication and we see periapical pathology. And if we go back to the history, the patient is symptomatic, asymptomatic. He reports cold and binding sensitivity six months ago that went away after several weeks. And that's not an unusual history that, that sometimes patients have a toothache. It's, it's sensitive to cold. The tooth has a pulpitis, you know, inflammation of the pulp. Um, we actually categorize that between reversible when it's early and irreversible later in its, its course. Um, but if they power through this, this symptomatic phase, what can happen is the tooth can become necrotic. And once it becomes necrotic, that cold sensitivity can go away, but then it can have all sorts of other problems. When we look at the current findings, it's negative to cold. So we did a cold test and didn't respond, which gives us some indication that the tooth might be necrotic, but now there's bite, there's ne it's negative to biting sensitivity. Um, no swelling or sinus tract because now this has become a chronic infection that's infecting the bone. And I asked for the universal numbering system. That's what we use when we do the one through 32. There's other numbering systems in this world. What is the number of the tooth with a large caries lesion and a periapical radiolucency? Well, if we look at the anatomy of this tooth, there's a mesial and a distal root. Well, that's consistent with a mandibular tooth. Other tidbits we can get if we look at the second molar and, and this it usually isn't helpful, but it happens to be a little helpful in this case. It's got four distinct cusps that we can see just from the angulation on this film. Again, that's typically not helpful, but it is in this case. So we are looking at a mandibular tooth. And if we look at its position, the arch, remember it's, this is as we're looking at the patient. This is on the patient's right side. So this is tooth number 30. All right, let's go to question two. 55-year-old male, again, we look at the anatomy of these teeth, they're fully formed, makes some sense, right? He's got um, severe biting sensitivity. Does that make sense? Well, there's a, there's a periapical radiolucency, and what's going on here? The tooth has had a previous root canal therapy. So the tooth is reinfected if this was a, a root canal that was done, done previously. Um, I don't like to say a, a root canal has failed because maybe the root canal was fine and the patient failed for various things. Maybe the root fractured. Um, maybe the patient didn't get a restoration on this tooth in a timely manner and it got re, it was um, recontaminated and the patient was counseled that it, that it might be, the root canal might be fine. So the previous case, there was no biting sensitivity and there was a periapical radiolucency and that can happen. Or there can be biting sensitivity with a periapical radiolucency. And the terms we use for that, and that this, this lecture is not about you learning these terms, but we know there's, there's periapical pathology, a lesion of endodontic origin. In this case, it would be called an asymptomatic apical periodontitis. The previous case, it, I, and I'm sorry, this one is a symptomatic apical periodontitis because it, it 
hurts to biting. The previous case was an asymptomatic apical periodontitis. We know there was inflammation at the apex, hence apical periodontitis. This one, it's symptomatic. Case one, it was asymptomatic. So it, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Um, patient denies spontaneous or cold sensitivity. Well, there's no, there's no vital pulp tissue because the tooth had a root canal, so we would not expect cold sensitivity. Current findings, negative to, to cold, no swelling or sinus tract. A sinus tract is basically a pimple on the gingiva, which gives a release for any pus that builds up, okay? And if a tooth has swelling or a tooth has a sinus tract, we give it a different parabrical um, diagnosis, okay? So we give teeth both a pulpal and a parabrical diagnosis. And again, asking the universal numbering system, what is the tooth number? Well, I'm gonna do a little, oh, and just before we do that, I um, just wanna note that this restoration was actually locked into the, the superior aspect of the canal. So they took out a little bit of the gutta percha root canal fill and locked in this restoration. Now, is this a, this is likely amalgam. Now, is this amalgam that's all the way around the crown of the tooth? It may or may not be. It could have a gold crown on it. And, and on a radiograph, we cannot distinguish gold crown from an amalgam. And if they overlapped, it all looks like one big restoration. But it, this actually may be a amalgam core with a crown over it. And we see this amalgam, likely amalgam restoration in this tooth. Again, it could be a gold inlay, but nobody does gold inlays on occlusal surfaces for class one restorations. We just don't see this. Now I'm gonna work a little, a little um, PowerPoint tooth over, and I'm turning it over because again, on this one, we see a mesial and distal root. Um, if we look at its position in the arch, this, this certainly looks like a, a mandibular molar. Um, if we align it up again, we're looking at the patient. This is the patient's lower right, so tooth number 30. Okay, let's look at case three. 55-year-old um, male, when we look at these teeth, this again looks like an adult. He, d he says there's severe biting sensitivity. Um, he reports severe pain to biting that is killing him. And we put it in quotes because the, the, those are words he used. We would not use those. That, that's not a scientific term. That's not a medical term. So anything a patient would say um, that, that we want to put in the chart, we often put it in quotes. He denies pain to cold, spontaneous pain, or swelling. Um, and and do we see anything? Yeah, again, this is another one with the pericle radiolucency and a large carious lesion. Um, testing revealed no response to cold. Um, he doesn't have any swelling or a sinus tract, but he has a bite test that reveals severe pain. So again, this fits with a tooth that's necrotic. It doesn't respond to cold, and it's got this apical inflammation that's, that's symptomatic. So we call this symptomatic apical periodontitis. A couple other things on this radiograph. You might note that this second molar um, has resorption, um, pretty significant resorption, but there's no radiolucency associated with it. It looks like normal bone around the apex. In fact, the distal, the, the, the other root also has some resorption. Idio it's idiopathic. We're not sure why it's there. We don't see a reason on this radiograph to indicate why there would be resorption of that tooth, but there is resorption. And idiopathic um, is a term we just means we don't know. Um, it's really kind of a cool word because it's we, we hook idiot and pathology together and call it idiopathic. We're idiots of the pathology of this tooth. Turn this over because this is another one that has a distinct mesial and distal root that fits with the lower molar. Um, now we have to determine what side of the mouth we're on, but again, if we're looking at the patient, this would be the patient's left side, so tooth number 19. The other thing you might note on this tooth is the roots look a little odd on even the first molar, and this is what we call hypercementosis. We have cementum at the apex of a tooth, and sometimes that cementum can get enlarged, and we call that hypercementosis. And that can happen for a variety of reasons. One of the more common reasons is if a tooth is super erupted a little bit. And with this large carious lesion, it may not have been an occlusion. This tooth may have erupted, you know, it may have super eruption just means it continues to, um, since it's not an occlusion, will continue kind of working its way out. I know I mentioned earlier that tooth loses their eruptive force once the roots are formed, but a tooth in your mouth um, that's not an occlusion will have a tendency to move a little bit. 
Okay. And, and a little different than tooth eruption. It's not a, a driven force, but we do, a tooth can do what we call super eruption. So I hope that's helpful thinking about tooth numbering. Um, uh, I guess we actually have to answer the question though. So if this is tooth number 19, the tooth just distal to it would be tooth number 18 and the tooth even more distal would be tooth number 17. So the correct answer to this would be tooth number 17. Now we look at this third molar, tooth 17, you can say it's horizontally impacted. Why do I say that? Because the tooth is pointing directly mesial. You know, the occlusal surface is directed directly mesial, so, so horizontally impacted. Now this tooth is partially erupted. And again, how do I say that? Because that the most superior part of this tooth is through the bone. So this is a tooth that's likely to cause some problems, either a patient getting some food products and plaque underneath um, the gingiva around this tooth, and we call that a pericoronitis, inflammation around the crown of a tooth, like corona the beer is crown, but it can also get plaque along the occlusal surface of 17 and cause not just caries on 17, but also on 18 and maybe some bone loss. And you can imagine if they take out 17, there's gonna be some bone that might not be supporting the distal root of number 18. So it may be an artificial perio pocket as well once 17 is out, but that can be um, corrected surg surgically and making an, an, an instance on the distal of tooth number 18 that is self-cleansing at least in an area you can get a patient get back there and clean. So I certainly hope this was helpful. Um, enjoyed doing this. And if you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out. And as you're doing rotations and looking at cases in the clinic, it's a good time to practice this and, and work with other students as well and, and making sure you understand these concepts. So thank you. Bye.